What do you get when you take a yacht filled with cocaine, booze, and hookers, add a condom that won't come out of its box, and sprinkle in some Mets baseball? You get a fresh episode of the Savage Sack Tap, and it starts right now. You're listening to the Savage Sack Tap. It's not a podcast. It's not a half cast. It's just a quick shot to the balls to help you finish off the week. We're cutting through the bullshit, filling your Friday with rage-fueled logic, and cracking a few jokes along the way. So grab a bag of frozen peas. There's a savage sack tap coming your way. Savage sack tap, Mike Montone. Let's do it. Uh, I absolutely, I fucking love that video clip. Uh, I, if you don't remember what that was, it was that fucking doctor getting his ass kicked and dragged off of the United flight a couple years ago. I, that that lady. Oh my God! What are you doing? Stop it! Oh, I wish they had dragged that dumb cunt off. Jesus Christ, she was uh, she was just so fucking annoying. But what a pussy that guy was. What a fucking jerk-off. Um, I, I, I hate anyone, anyone who causes disturbance on a fucking, on a fucking flight. Um, and, and then it was, he, he, remember, he said he was a doctor, was what his claim was. It turned out he was, like, a very, like, discredited, or, like, he had gotten, I think he had gotten in trouble for, um, like, selling selling pills to guys uh, in exchange for for gay sex in uh, in motel rooms or something like that don't don't quote me on that. that's not official news that's just something i read on the internet you have to look it up on your own um i'm not i'm not looking to to relitigate uh dr dow's uh sex for pills case but that is that is something i saw floating around out there uh but he's back he's back in the news because i guess he uh, he says he just watched the video for the first time which is uh, which is weird because that happened, like I said, like three fucking years ago. But I I get it. You, you, you hate seeing yourself on camera. I can actually I can see myself on the on the feed right here, and and even this is I planned this, and it's fucking it's awkward to to see yourself on camera. So I guess I I get that part of it. But I don't know what made him three years later just be like, you know what? Now it's time. Now I'll screen it. It's like. Uh, it's like when they find uh, like a, a long lost film from a, a famous Hollywood director, and they screen it like thirty years later. Something he made when he was uh, when he was majoring in film studies, back junior year, and it, it hasn't it, it hasn't seen the light of day since the seventies. <laughs> Finally, it comes back, uh, but he says, uh, "I just cried." <laughs> Not couldn't be. It, it, did you cry or or did you like wail like a banshee like you did in that video? He's like, ah, ah, ah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was like blood curdling. Like, what kind of man yet shrieks like that? Come on, dude. Uh, he says he didn't leave his house for months. Uh, it it would have all it would have all been e- easier if you had just left the plane uh, for a few minutes. They they were they would have booked you on the next the next flight. That's those are the rules. Those. This is why I don't feel sympathy for him. Is because usually I'm a big rule breaker. You'd be like Mike. You, you're always standing up to uh, authority and telling the man to go fuck himself. Shouldn't you be siding with the with with the uh, the good doctor? Well, apparently not a very good doctor because he got in trouble for trading pills for gay sex. That that's not part of the Hippocratic oath. Um, but um, I <laughs> first do no harm. Second. It's kind of cool to trade pills to get your cock sucked. Um, no, I, uh, I, the airplane is one of those places where I feel like you've, when you get on the plane, well, not only do you agree because there's all sorts of, like, shit that you click and agree to when you, you know, get your ticket that you will play by their rules, but I feel like if you, if you're gonna go 30,000 feet in the air in this little capsule, 
um, and we're all trying to get to the same place safely. We hope it doesn't, you know, crash into a mountain or some asshole doesn't try to open the emergency door or fucking, you know, hijack the plane. Whatever, all the terrible things that could happen at 30,000 feet. You, you're, you're playing by their rules now. You have decided to get into their fucking wacko sky vessel. You're going to play by their rules. I don't care if if you're a guy pretending to still be a, a doctor in good standing. Uh, th and that fucking lady screaming, no, 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 what are they doing? What are they, shut the fuck up, lady. I, they should have dragged that fucking bitch off too. What a fucking, ugh, they, it's not, they weren't dragging him off to Auschwitz. I fucking hate when this happens. My stupid shit is so fucking slow over here, and I'm like, I'm like, fucking autistic the way I'm easily distracted by it. I'm, apologies if anyone watching is autistic, but, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, I had a retarded cousin, so I can say so. I think that just made it worse, actually. Um, but, uh, no, it's fucking, it keeps, like, pausing and freezing up, and it drives me, uh, it drives me fucking nuts. In, in any case, uh, there was the, she's screaming, they're not taking him to the, the fucking gulag. He's not, he's just gonna go, all he would have to do is get off, they're gonna comp him a, a meal at the Chili's 2 in the terminal, and, and that's it. Like, they had to get, they had to get seating for pilots. It's the air, it's their fucking plane. Like, that, I realize, yeah, maybe, uh, you know, not the best idea to drag him off kicking and screaming, but also, you're a grown, you're a grown fucking man. Like, why are you resisting this? Like, I, I know everyone's miserable at the airport and flying fucking blows, and you know, you're sitting in coach stuck to ne next to some asshole. Like, yeah, all, all of these things are, are terrible. Maybe there's a baby crying. I don't know how long they sat on the tarmac. Y you get irritated when you fly. I get it. It's a huge kick in the balls, and then to, to, to realize that the experience is going to be extended by a few hours because you have to wait for, for a later flight, yeah, kind of sucks. But also... Again, you're getting into their fucking flying, dangerous sky machine filled with jet fuel that's going to be soaring in the, uh, amongst the heavens. At some point, they kind of get to make the rules. Uh, and, you know, again, as a, a grown man, I feel like there should be very few circumstances where it's acceptable to let out a blood-curdling scream. Can I play that again? I want to... Let's see if I can get back to the... Uh, Back to the screaming. Holy shit. I mean, can you imagine, think in your own life of things that would elicit that kind of, of scream? I can, like, getting your cock chopped off or watching, like, uh, you know, a loved one be, you know, v you know, violently sodomized and there's nothing you, you can do about it, I guess. Uh, the only things... That, that I can think of, that that would uh, allow for that kind of, of blood-curdling screaming. Uh, seriously, it just what... You know, be a fucking man, dude. Uh, honestly, that's that's all, all I can say. I think I prematurely left that note card. Yeah, be a, be a fucking man. Uh, in conclusion, be a fucking man. Not the, this fucking pill-popping pussy. Um, anyway... Uh, I I am still very much exhausted from uh, from the weekend, which well last weekend, which actually started a week ago, like right nowish. Um, last uh, last Thursday was the New York Mets home opener. Uh, as you know, I am a, a New York Mets fan, uh, so I I had, to, I had to get out to the ballpark, get a, I had to get a nice early pregame in. I, I rode uh, I took the path in. One of my favorite things to do on on the day of the Mets home opener is to drink on the path train around all of the dipshits who are commuting, going to the office that day, which I don't understand. I feel like the home, if you have a baseball team in your town, you need to take off the day of the home opener. It's a big party. It's like a fucking, it's, I, I, it's, I'm trying to figure out like what to, uh, what to compare it to. It's uh, different than the uh, NFL opening Sunday because that everybody's off and everyone's watching football. Uh, Major League Baseball, a home opener, uh, is like, it's, 
you know, you're playing hooky from work, all these other dipshits are at the office, but you're having a good time, I was drinking on the fucking path train, these assholes are giving me fucking dirty looks because I'm drinking a beer at 10 a.m., like, fuck yourself, there's not something wrong with me, there's something wrong with you, that it's going to be a beautiful Saturday, there's going to be a, a, a day baseball game going on after months of fucking winter, and, and your dumb ass is on the way to the office to sit in a, sit in a cube, Got to get those, got to get those deliberal deliverables into Mr. Johnson by 4 p.m. I don't have time for frivolous things like baseball. Um, now, nah, fuck yourself. Um, but yeah, I um, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. And then after I got off the path, you you hop the L I double R, and uh, I met met the buddies, and we pre-gamed uh, under a bridge. Literally, I I I was a a 33-year-old man drinking under a Northern Boulevard overpass across from uh, from City Field on a Thursday morning. That feels good. That is, that is, I feel like the height of uh, of white privilege. A real sign of success. Any under any other circumstances, if if a bunch of guys were were drinking under a a bridge at nine in the morning, there'd probably be like a cop showing up. Like, all right, guys, move along, move along. Y'all got places to be. But in this situation, police were actually, uh, you know, gu- guiding traffic and making sure the under-the-bridge drinkers didn't get mowed down by an SUV. So, uh, fantastic, fantastic stuff. I don't know, I do not know what Al-Qaeda hates us so much for. If I was them, I would be 100% on board. I'd be like, forget about the goats and the mountains out here. Afghanistan is for the fucking birds. I'm going to the USA, going to drink under a bridge and watch some baseball. Maybe take a, uh, maybe I won't, maybe I won't crash the United, the United flight. It's way too much fun watching these Asian doctors get their asses kicked. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I didn't go into the game. We just watched the whole thing from the, uh, the bar at McFadden's. Um, and then, uh, on my way home, I got, I got fucking wasted, uh, because just, it's, it's the pregame drinking and then, uh, you know, nine innings worth of drinking, and then it's McFadden's is a fucking party after the game, even though they they fucking lost to the Nationals. So we kept drinking after that. We were doing we were doing Jaeger shots with butch lesbians. That was great. Think about that. You motherfuckers were at work. I was I was watching baseball and ripping shots of Jaeger with some fucking midget short haired dyke. What is and and what a sweet lady. Um. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, said, speaking of, uh, the LGBTQIAA community, uh, I was, uh, I was on my way home, and usually I grab pizza after the, uh, the home opener, um, because, uh, there's a, there's a place right by the, uh, the bus station in Hoboken that I like to go to, but, uh, I, I happened upon, uh, by pure happenstance, uh, a Chick-fil-A in, uh, Midtown, and I, I kind of make it a point whenever possible. I'm not a huge fast food guy, but I always try to, uh, to stop at Chick-fil-A because the, uh, they are, if you don't know, they are the gay hating chicken, uh, allegedly. Um, the, the sort of, uh, fun online, uh, rumor trope, I don't, I don't know what you, uh, what you want to call it, is that, uh, Chick-fil-A hates the gay community. They are not a gay ally, and the reason for this is that they, uh, they're owned by a Christian family. That's also why they're they're closed on Sunday, um, and they donate to a number of charities that are believed to, uh, or I guess, uh, support uh, various forms of uh, you know anti-gay uh, whatever the fuck, like the conversion therapy and 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 whatnot. And the <clears throat> I guess there's it's six degrees of homophobia now. Um, so the gay community has like lashed out. At uh, at Chick Fil A, which I think is is kind of disingenuous. I mean, one of the charities is the Salvation Army, and I I do not believe I have ever heard much outcry from the gay community about like the NFL. The NFL keeps a big fucking Salvation Army uh, kettle in the end zone. At uh, Zeke Elliott, uh, quite famously, jumped into uh, the Salvation Army uh, kettle after scoring a touchdown, uh, and uh, you never hear a uh, 
boycott the NFL because you hear boycott the NFL because of literally everything else, uh, but never because they they do business with uh, the Salvation Army, which I, I found uh, kind of strange. I didn't even know that the Salvation Army was involved in such things. They do do a lot of good, right? They you know like feeding and clothing the homeless. Maybe we can maybe we can overlook their views on a single issue. Um, and by every account, people who work for Chick Fil A say it's say it's a great company. Uh, their sandwiches are fantastic. Um, their their sauces are fantastic. Their waffle fries will blow your fucking socks off. Uh, so I'm I'm sorry, gays. I'm sorry. I'm going to continue to eat it at Chick Fil A. And I believe this came up the the last episode of um, of Flippin' Out Radio that uh, I did with uh, my uh, my co-host James Flippin. Who, if you uh, if you caught. Uh, uh, one of our more recent episodes, you uh, will know that he is a, a member of the bisexual community, uh, and uh, he gave me okay to eat the uh, the, the gay hate and chicken. Uh, I it's confusing though. I will say on Chick Fil A's uh, part that they would they would continue to alienate uh, a market segment that loves feasting on cock uh, like the gay community does. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Eat the fucking chicken. It's it's very, it's very very tasty. I keep going away from my note cards too uh, too quickly. Which, if you're listening to the audio, you don't know that. I could fucking lie. But if you're watching the uh, the stream, it would be incredibly disingenuous. So anyway, uh, yeah. It's Saturday, uh, got up, got up, uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed on Saturday. Uh, went down to uh, went to Belmar, my uh, my home away from home, my favorite stretch of sand in New Jersey with uh, with the brother and the sister, and checked out uh, all my all my old haunts. Um, stopped by, uh, we went to uh, Bar A for a little while, and it was nice. They were having some sort of like, uh, it must have been like a beer tasting event, and combined with that was this big uh, big buffet. Which of course you would you would have to pay to get into such a thing. They give you a wristband, etc. Uh, being the duplicitous, uh, sneaky, uh, lying, uh, untrustworthy douchebags that we are, uh, we just walked right by the woman who was giving out the uh, the wristbands without dropping a cent in the bucket. Uh, we brought in our our outside drinks from the from the uh, cash bar. Uh, but then my my brother made his way up to the buffet line and very discreetly loaded up uh, plates and I guess they the security was incredibly light because uh, under other uh, under other circumstances I would have I would have assumed that he'd be uh, snatched up and beaten like Rodney King but uh, no he came back with a nice big plate full of uh, of sliders for us which were absolutely uh, delicious so. Uh, Thank you, Bar A, for your lax buffet security practices, because very, very tasty. Um, yeah, then we uh, went up to uh, DJ's. They were open. I guess they were having a, a spring fling party that night. It was it was dead when we were there. There were only uh, probably like less than a couple dozen people, but the Mets game was on. Had the uh, the ocean view seating. I feel like it's my favorite bar to, to hang out at at DJ's. Is the uh, that ocean window bar right when you walk in on the left. Um, it was just a killer afternoon. Just drank, drank beers, looked at the ocean, watched the, uh, watched the Mets, and then went to uh, to Tenth Ave Burrito and and just feasted on some massive gut bombs. So, needless to say, I was farting my fucking hole off on uh, on Sunday uh, when I went back when I went back to City Field for uh, round two. Yeah, got out to. Uh, Got out to go sh- uh, get shitty at City uh, twice in one weekend, which is which is always good. Uh, pricey, but good. It was uh, it was Jacob Degrom bobblehead day, and let me tell you something. We got off the L I double R, and we walked down. There's uh, there's like this long boardwalk that takes you from from the train to the stadium, um, and you have to walk down s- steps to get get off of it, and you don't see what's going on until you get, there's like this, uh, sort of like a passage through where they have bathrooms and stuff. And when we, it's like coming out of the birth canal. When we, uh, we stepped out of it and the light hit our faces instead of, uh, instead of a doctor ready to, to slap us and snip the umbilical cord and pass us off to dad, there were just thousands of people. Usually you can move about quite freely. There was a line literally from the stadium 
weaving all the way back. I mean, it was like tentacles. They were coming out of every entrance of the state. You would have thought that it was a fucking, like, a playoff game or something like that, the way people were lined up. This was two hours before the first pitch. The reason that they were there was for the Jacob de Gram bobblehead. And the line, not made up, made, mo, let me get the cock out of my fucking mouth, not made up mostly of, like, children, you know, kids who love Jake DeGrom, and they want, they're going to cherish this, and it's going to go, you know, going to go in their room next to, uh, next to their fucking David Wright rookie card, and they, and they love them, at, you know, uh, uh, something you would kind of understand, right, you know, uh, because baseball is really, what is it, for baseball is for young American boys, that's who baseball is really for, right, um, and you would think that that's who would be lining up to get this Jacob deGrom bobblehead doll. A doll. You would think it would be children who were lined up hours before the start of a game on a weekend morning for a doll. I'm going to say the word for a doll once again. You would think this would be children, right? The thousands of people wearing jerseys with the names of players on their backs lined up to get a doll, you would think those would be kids. You would not think that they would be, say, middle-aged men. I was wrong. It was all middle-aged men. It was middle-aged men who were, like, dragging and berating their wives for getting the... because they got there late and they were gonna have to stand on line and they might miss out on, on the doll. Imagine... The, picture your... whatever you're doing right now. Whatever is going on in your life, I want you to imagine yourself, if you're like, you know, I assume most of my, my listeners here are probably, you know, from their mid-late 20s to the, you know, mid-30s. Imagine yourself, the grown man that you are, waking up on a Sunday morning next, next to your girlfriend, your wife, and look, looking at her and saying, Honey, we've got to get to the ballpark. They're giving away a doll of this really athletic guy and then putting your shirt on that has that guy's name on the back and getting again so keyed up that you get to the ballpark hours early to stand online to to stand in a line of thousands of people because you so desperately need a doll of, I believe DeGrom is like 30 years old. The guys on this line were for the most part like in their 50s. Can you, uh, just, f what would fucking drive you to do that? How about this? It's a Sunday morning. You're taking your wife or your girlfriend to the ballpark. That's a, a very nice treat. You know what? You should probably start the day by, it would be nice if she sucked your cock to start the day. And then, you know, maybe made you a nice plate of eggs since you're taking her out for an expensive day at, at the ballpark. Instead, you drag her to the stadium and then you yell at her. I, it's no shit. We were walking behind a guy who was yelling at his wife or his girlfriend or whatever. And he was wearing a fucking Jacob de Gram jersey. He looked like he was a couple years away from retirement age. And he was furious that they weren't going to get a bobblehead doll. I'm just mind-blowing. How is that... How is a woman even spending time with that guy? Like, the only way you're allowed to be a grown man and get that riled up and excited about a, a, a toy, a bobblehead doll of a Major League Baseball player is, is if you're a retarded guy. You're living in a fucking group home and they're taking you guys out to the ballpark for an F. That's the only circumstances. Um, it, it is so bizarre to me when grown men, like, lust after professional athletes like this. Like, be, are you that insecure in yourself as a man that you have to look at, at, at like, a bunch of strapping athletic guys and, and be like, you know what, not only, not only do I want to wear your name on my back like I'm, I'm your girlfriend and you're gonna fuck me after prom, but I, I need a statue of you on my shelf so that when I can't see you on TV or on my phone, or think about my favorite moments from your career, I can just look wistfully at you in doll form. Fucking bizarre. I, seriously. If, if you are 55 years old in a 30-year-old man's jersey, berating your wife over, over a doll of said 30-year-old man, please, please, stop. 
pause, take a minute, unfuck your life, and while you're doing that, I'm going to fuck your no undoubtedly unsatisfied wife. Because there is no way that a guy who wears a younger man's jersey and stands on line for a doll of a younger man is making his wife come. The, the two are absolutely mutually exclusive. Um, yeah. Well, from America's pastime to, uh, one of America's other pastimes, politics! Oh, what a, what a segue. No, that was, uh, that was terrible. Uh, no, the, uh, this is not a political show, but every once in a while, the political stupidity kind of revs up to a point in this country where we at least, we at least have to pause for a moment to ridicule the political class, and I... I woke up, uh, was it yesterday or the day before? It was like Tuesday, maybe? I don't fucking know. I'm, uh, I might have CTE. I get my days confused. Uh, but, and I found that, uh, the, the hashtag yachts, cocaine, and prostitutes was trending, which was fantastic. I mean, I, you, if you wake me up to yachts, cocaine, and prostitutes, I, I know it's going to be a good day. Uh, the, I guess the libs were trolling, uh, Devin Nunez, he apparently invests in a winery in, in California, and that winery threw uh, what sounds like an absolute banger of a boat party for, uh, you know, whatever promotional shit they do. I think it was like, I think it was raffled off. I think it was like a charity thing. They raffled off a, uh, a yacht party. Uh, but from the, uh, I'm not going to read the whole article. I just wanted to uh, read, they, this was the, the line, um, that uh, kind of explained why they were using this hashtag. Um, men on the... It was like a, a group of dudes just came on with prostitutes, hard liquor, and what appeared to be cocaine. Uh, let me tell you something. You take you take yachts, cocaine, and, uh, and hookers, and combine that with uh, Roger Stone going to these big group sex parties with his busty-ass wife, the GOP is fucking cool. I mean... No one, when I was growing up, uh, if they're if they're sponsoring coke and, and booze fueled yacht trips with uh, with hookers and and going to orgies with uh, with really busty uh, sexually curious women, I, I gotta tell you, the Republicans are sounding like uh, like a, like like a lot of fun. I mean, I can I can get down with anyone who is down with doing coke with a bunch of hookers on. Uh, on a yacht, um, cocaine up noses, fishnet pantyhoses, these are a few of my favorite things, um, <laughs> uh, also in, in politics, uh, uber douche, Eric, uh, is it Solwell, Silwell, I don't know, jerk off, uh, he's a state rep from California, um, he announced for 2020, he is running on the We Will Take Your Guns Away platform. He was on uh, Real Time with, with Bill Maher uh, like two weeks ago and pretty much said, look, we're going to start, we're, we're going to create a confiscation or buyback program for, uh, for assault rifles. Um, and we are going to, uh, if, if you don't comply, we're going to send uh, federal marshals to your, to your home and take them away. We, so he literally said, we are coming uh, for your guns. And he got into a Twitter exchange with someone, and uh, they, they said, like, you know, you can, you can take our guns when you come and take them. And uh, he said, uh, you know, essentially, he said, you can't fight the government because we have nuclear weapons. Now, obviously, he was not threatening to nuke the American people, we hope. We hope that the, the left-wing demagoguery has not gotten that, that far. Um, but it is... It kind of raises a point that I've made before, which is the you, the government is too powerful and too strong. You can't fight them, so so turn over your weapons because they are rendered useless by the awesome power of the United States. Right? You can't fight us, so give up your freedom. You know, let, you know I I and I do need to because I I've been reading. Um, Lone Survivor, the Marcus Luttrell uh, story is the Navy SEAL who, um, he peer, he's on Fox News and, and shit all the time. Not a big fan of the libs, if, if you're not familiar with him. But uh, he, uh, he is, the, there was, uh, it was 2005, they were going after a, 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 
Taliban leader in uh, the Hindu Kush mountains of uh, Afghanistan, and it was a four-man team, and the rest of his team got wiped out by, uh, it was like an ambush, like they sent like, all, this looks like almost two, they think between one and two hundred uh, Taliban fighters after him. Four, four Navy SEALs, by the way, held off a company-sized assault for, uh, for like days, uh, and he, he was eventually rescued by uh, some, some local villagers. Um, but uh, the, the point being that the Taliban fights primarily, obviously they have some, some bigger toys, but groups like the, the, the Taliban, the Viet Cong, you know, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, all these insurgencies throughout the, uh, throughout the years, uh, the American Revolution, uh, you know, it's, uh, history is ripe with examples of uh, small arm, you know, armed groups fighting off much bigger, more technologically sophisticated armies using just small arms and maybe, you know, essentially light weaponry with, you know, one, you know, the odd, like I said, big toy that they get their uh, get their hands on. The colonists famously uh, stole a cannon from the redcoats uh, at the uh, at the beginning of the uh, the American Revolution. But uh, yeah, I I hate that attitude that. Oh, the the U.S. government. If they just hey man, if they want you, they're just man. So like, turn over your weapons, man, because we don't need another mass shooting, man. Um, no, it's uh, you know one of the uh, the cornerstones of our American freedom is the right to keep and bear arms. The cornerstone of freedom in general is the right to uh, to defend and protect yourself against. Uh, uh, a potentially oppressive uh, government. It is uh, the the Second Amendment. I, had, I I once believed as a veteran. I didn't think civilians should be really trusted to own many firearms. But then, um, I think if you look at it through a more freedom oriented lens, the it becomes clear that while it may not be ideal to have a bunch of because you know Americans by and large are complete fucking morons. Uh, it may not be ideal to have a bunch of morons running around with guns, uh, the opposite, uh, allowing a government to completely control violent means of coercion is actually a far, far worse idea with, uh, potentially far more dire consequences. And again, look at, uh, all of the times throughout history that governments have, you know, enslaved people, thrown them into to camps, executed, it's just, it's disgusting. I mean, and into the, people say, well, that hasn't happened in a long time, except for, like, right literally right now there are fucking slave markets in libya um and oh there's all sorts of ethnic cleansing and shit constantly going on um what else are the democrats doing oh joe biden this is great what a week for joe biden uh just getting they the, the democrats they're in the primary uh and they have decided that the best move the, their best bet for defeating trump in 2020 is to railroad their most electable candidate. And I'm not like a huge Biden guy policy wise. He seems like a pretty cool dude. Um, and I'd probably love to like hang out and, uh, you know, drink beers, chase trim with him. But, um, they've, they're essentially like trying to flush him out of the fucking election before primary, the primaries even really get going, uh, because, uh, he hugs people. I know, I know horrible. I, I too was aghast when I saw the footage of him hugging people. Uh, not discreetly, not behind clothes. So brazen, in fact, that this, this over-aggressive cocksucker was doing it in public because of his white male privilege. Let's him get away with anything. Um, and look, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. I'm, I'm not a hug guy. I am a a get your fucking hands off of me guy unless unless you are a very attractive woman who would like to suck my cock you don't need to touch me um so i get the idea of of not wanting to be like touched or grabbed or, or hated but there's a way to handle that and it's a hey all right get get the fuck off me um so there's unwanted touching which is the hey how you do oh sorry i didn't realize that you were a person who doesn't like to be grabbed like that i will proceed with more care next time uh, and then there is sexual assault, and they are not the same thing. I mean, this is the 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 Me Too movement is very very flawed, but this may be one of its biggest flaws: is taking guys like Al Franken and Joe Biden, who would otherwise, uh, you know, absolutely align themselves with your cause 
and and work to to advance the uh, the rights of, of women and, and and sex assault victims to uh, to railroad them and lump them in with guys like say you know Harvey Weinstein who's you know, taking his cock out and jerking off into a fucking potted plant is it's it's disingenuous at best but what's more frightening is there's some people I, you know, I teeter between not knowing if this is, oh, it's 2019 and we actually have expanded the definition of sex assault to include all of these these weird things, or it's these people are being hyper fucking trolls and they know they can latch on to something and discredit any of their, their opponents so that they can further their own cause. Like, because Biden is more of a centrist Democrat, so... If you say uh, want a super progressive like you know Sanders or you know fucking I don't know Warren who whoever to, to win the win the primary, if you are willing to compromise your own own values and pretend that you see this as sex assault simply to, to eliminate Biden, the problem with that is you are going to again Biden I thought would have would have been one of your fucking guys, but you are gonna sweep a lot of motherfuckers up up in that, and, uh, yeah, it, it does not, it does not make, uh, sense to me, it seems like no one, no one's electable anymore, we've just, we're, when you were making up the rules as we go along, and now, public hugging from seven years ago is, that's it, you're out, um, you know, for, for people who value diversity, they really seem to love conformity, um, anyway, uh, more stupidity coming up after the jump, First, I should probably plug uh, plug the old social media pages here. Uh, Facebook.com slash The Savage Crew is where you are uh, watching this. Uh, at Mike Montone on Twitter. A lot of fun on Twitter. I do love to do some tweeting. And uh, at Gary underscore Moiler, M-O-Y-L-E-R on, uh, on the Instagram. Uh, you can find, of course, the, uh, the audio uh, of the uh, the podcast is always available at the Savage Crew dot Libsyn L I B S Y N uh, dot com. Uh, we are going to talk about consent condoms and the dress for respect. Okay, um, consent condoms. Just a moment. Here we go. CBS News. Consent condom requires four hands to open, making powerful statement about consent. Oh my. Uh, With consent at the forefront of modern conversations about sex, one company is highlighting its importance in a unique way. Argentinian company Tulipan has created a consent condom that requires four hands to be opened intending to raise awareness about consent in the bedroom. If they don't say yes, it means no, the tagline on a video demonstration says. Consent is the most important thing in sex. Uh, I would argue that lubrication is the most important thing in sex, but who the fuck am I? Um, So the consent condom, um, they say... uh, they created the consent pack. The box can only be opened if four hands simultaneously press buttons on each side of the box, unlocking the condom inside. Uh, so I guess it's got a yeah, it's got like a, it's got buttons on on each side, and you you have to press at the uh, the same time. And here's here's the thing, I'm not sure which rapist this is meant to stop. Right? It seems like if I'm, if I am even the least resourceful rapist out there, I can, I can kind of circumvent this one. First of all, how many guys are going around putting a condom on to rape anyway? Is that common? How does that even work? I mean, you would, I'm like the physical logistics of it, do you... Do you put the condom on your soft penis before you head out to do raping, and then your erection just grows into the penis into the condom 
once you spot your target because that would sound like a really difficult circumstance to even get an erection under. Um, I mean, nothing kills an erection quicker than a condom. Um, and then, you know, what? You're, you got it on, on your soft dick, and you're trying, you're trying to work up a rod in there before the victim, you know, like, walks away down the street. Uh, what, it's like you're chasing... Then do you... Do you take your pants off and then approach the victim so that you can at least... I Like, it just doesn't... And then, I mean, what, what's your other option is to is to slip it on once you're already hard, when you have the victim pinned down, because then it's going to be very difficult to keep the victim in one spot. They're going to be wriggling and trying to get away, and, you know, assuming it's at least, like, a 95-pound woman, I just don't... I don't see how you're going to effectively pull off rape. I mean, are there... Are there rapists out there who are stopping to put on con? I assumed that most rape happened with an uncondomed penis, and then for the con, for like, you know, at what what what, at what point in your rape career do you become a courteous enough rapist to stop and put on a condom of the victim's choosing? I guess is my question. Like, has there ever been a rapist who showed up with like? They, just like a regular, you know, ribbed Trojan, and the victim was like, uh, 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 before you rob me of my innocence, I'm going to have to ask you to use the consent condom. It just, you see here, we all push a button. Thank you. Yes. Now you can go back to ravaging me against my will, and I will just, uh, I'm gonna play some, some angry birds here, and then when it's done, I'll, I'll get the rape kit done. I, I, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it make an ounce of sense to me. Who the fuck is wearing... It almost seems, like, who would, no one would choose to wear a condom, so why would you choose to wear one during rape? I'm just so confused by this. So this, yeah, I, I, baffling. And then, what if you're like an amputee having consensual sex? How does that work? You, do you have to like, you use your nubs or... You have to now. You have to get prosthetic fingers to open this stupid fucking condom. It's like I'd really, I would very much like to fuck the shit out of you, but we can't even get this stupid fucking thing out of the box. Uh, yeah, this is all, this is all very bizarre to me. Apparently, the feminists aren't buying it either. They're they're like this is, they they called bullshit on it. This is like one of the first times the feminists and I are on the same side. And I believe they raised like the exact same concerns and objections. Um. But yeah, moving on, more from the, uh, the world of, uh, of sexual consent and harassment and Me Too and whatever the fuck is, uh, is going on, uh, the smart dress that is bringing sexual harassment into the limelight. Yeah, let me tell you something, sexual harassment has been in the limelight for a lot longer than this, uh, this stupid dress, um... It says, uh, following the hashtag MeToo movement, numerous companies have been addressing sexual harassment in either similar campaigns or in advertisement to bring these issues up and out in the open. Swiss, be Ugh. Swiss beverage company Schweppes and Brazilian ad agency Ogilvy decided to work together on the Dress for Respect a smart dress that was designed to sense and track moments of where and when the wearer was touched. Uh, I don't understand why Schweppes is getting involved in the sexual harassment sensory dress game. Like, you're a fucking ginger ale company. Were people getting hopped up on ginger ale and committing sexual assault to the point where Schweppes was like, look, we now have a responsibility to the community to step up and do something. I don't... Just just make the ginger ale. That's what you guys do. There are people out there whose job it is to pre prevent harassment and, and sex assault and stuff. They're not... They, you should be spending the overwhelming bulk of your time making and selling ginger ale if you're Schweppes. Not let the let the professionals handle sexual assault and sexual harassment. You're not making a fucking dent, all right? You're probably hindering things by coming up with stupid ideas that people like me are going to make fun of on the internet. 
um, thus, uh, you know, devaluing the entire cause. Uh, the aim of the advertisement was to show the public, particularly those that do not believe this to be an issue, that sexual harassment happens more often than they think, and that it is a real issue. Uh, in the video campaign produced by Ogilvy, three Brazilian women are seen wearing the dress and are sent to a nightclub. The start of the video features some men who do not believe that sexual harassment is an issue, and the remaining part of the video aims to show how big the issue really is. One man was seen to say that women were just complaining about everything. Oh, pff, tell me about it, huh? Fucking broads. Um, the team behind the technology of the dress are seen in another room where a computer shows the positions and intensities of where and when the women are touched during the night. Uh, so, yeah, okay. Uh, let's see. Certain areas of the body that were touched more than others include the backside, arms, and lower back. In less than four hours, the women are touched inappropriately a whopping 157 times. A terrifying one or more touches every five minutes. And it's, yeah, like, it's like I said, it's uh, sensors placed all around, around the dress. And uh, they, they pick up uh, when the, uh, the person was touched. And I guess it sends a signal back to uh, a heat map. Um, so, the thing is, it, again, it's a very, a very tight, form-fitting dress, uh, to be worn at a, a nightclub. Uh, if you go to a nightclub, you're going, you're going to get fucking, uh, uh, touched and, and, and groped, and it's, that's what people do at nightclubs. They grind, and they grab, and they make out, and they rub genitals against each other. And the mere act of walking through a nightclub means you're going to be making bodily contact with a lot of people. It's never easy to move around when you're up in the club. They, they pack those things into fucking, they're like sardine cans. They're, they're, just, they're just big fucking music and sex-filled fire hazards. Uh, so to, to be like, oh, I went to a club and people touched my body 157 times, like, that's literally just the, the cost of walking through a club. It happens to me, it happens to you, it happens to everyone. You are in the club. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that someone should be just be able to, to grab your ass or, you know, gr grab some puss, but at the same time, you are in an environment, you have, you have thrown yourself into an environment where people are getting hammered uh, with, with the intent to rub and grind up against each other and, and have a, a good sort of sexual time. Um, and again, not something that should, you know, you shouldn't be advanced upon if by someone that you don't want to, but there's sort of a there is, you're not supposed to say this, but a, a blurring of the lines, a gray area that exists inside a, of, a, of a, again, of a nightclub. I'm not saying, you know, at like your, at your corner pub or like a, you know, a, a corner bistro that people should get away with the same thing. But there is, I think, a, a social contract at play when you go into a hyper crowded space with loud music, dancing and alcohol uh, that you are kind of, that's what you're there for. That's what everyone is there for. That's why you, that's why you got dressed up and paid the cover. You know, we're all going to go out, we're going to get drunk, we're going to rub our bodies against each other. If a person that you're not into rubs their body uh, on or near you, then you just give them the stiff arm or the, the polite or not so polite, get the fuck out of there. Then, if they proceed, uh, with with said advances, then you I, I feel you have uh, reason to complain that there's bouncers and security and, and, and whatnot there, uh, and you can inform them. And of course, uh, if, if the situation's still not rectified, then you can uh, you can go on. But it just it seems disingenuous to send someone into a nightclub and say that oh look they they got you know they got touched a bunch of times well that's what happens when you go to a nightclub i go to a nightclub i go to i went to bar a in the middle of the afternoon uh, a couple years back and it was was slapped and grabbed on the ass twice by who i'm not sure and uh it was uh, a nice sunny day out um, me and my my buddy were standing around shirtless trying to catch a bronze and uh, a chick came up and like rubbed my che uh, chest and said, I like your shirt. Where did you get it? 
uh, if I had done that to a woman, like for me, it gave it, you know, it made my wiener jump a little bit because it was very exciting and titillating. Uh, if I had done that to a woman, I, I would be like in, in the parlance of, uh, the current times, the biggest fucking monster on, uh, on, on the planet. Uh, so you see, again, when you operate in these environments, you kind of, you, you, you play by the house rules. Um, and I think when you, you go into a night a nightclub. You have to assume that you're you're going to be touched a bunch of times. Male, female, she male, whatever. Nightclubs tend to result in a lot of touching, groping, and grinding. That is what they exist for. If you're not into that, go elsewhere. Uh, again, if it, you know there is a line that can be crossed, but I don't see how this stupid fucking dress. Uh, addresses that it should be if, if anything it should be like uh, a sensory bra or uh, and panty combo right because then you can tell if they're grabbing the, the important areas and then you'd at least have a case right if they go for a if you come right up and go for a tit or a pussy grab then you have uh, most certainly uh, crossed the line but it's just very disingenuous i i feel like um uh, kind of like if you remember that uh, there's that video of uh where they're like, this is what catcalling and street harassment really sound like, and they sent this, uh, they sent this chick with a big fat ass, glorious big fat ass, uh, they put her in a, a pair of, like, tight leggings, and sent her for a walk through New York City's most ethnic neighborhoods, like, literally, they weren't, it wasn't shot down at, like, Wall Street, the financial district, the Times Square, you know, no, no, nowhere where, you know, commerce was going on. Uh, she went through, like, like, you know, fucking Harlem and fucking Brooklyn and shit, uh, and, and was getting getting kind of, like, you know, hit on and approached by all of these uh, sort of, like, you know, black and Hispanic, like, street guys, uh, you know, the, you know, they weren't, let's just say they, it was, it looked like it was the middle of the day and they weren't at work. They were just kind of hanging out on the, on the stoop, uh, presumably waiting for white women with big fat asses to walk by so that they may comment on said big fat asses. Uh, and it was, it was then presented to us. 24 hours of footage were chopped down into like 15 minutes, uh, which by the way, if you can, if you can walk through a black or Hispanic neighborhood as a, a white woman with a big fat ass and only get like 15 minutes of, of guys uh, catcalling you. That's, I think that's actually a big, big win for the feminists. That means we're moving in the right direction. There's, there's a time when you probably could have had like three, four hours of footage. Um, ask, uh, ask Emmett Till. You too soon. Um, but no, I, I, I do not, I don't mind in, in theory, social justice, you know, trying to do good for marginalized or oppressed people. I think we can all agree that's a good thing. But then when it takes a disingenuous turn and you're a condom company making some stupid thing that are, again, uh, the condom for rapists who are at least considerate enough to stop and put on a condom of the victim's choosing before defiling them against their will or the dress that lets you know that if you go to a nightclub, someone may touch you uh, without your immediate and explicit consent, uh, being, you know, sponsored by a fucking ginger ale company. It just, it, it's just disingenuous and full of shit, and it, it undermines whatever the cause may be. Um, and, uh, and on that note, we are, uh, we are approaching the one hour mark here on the Savage Sack Tap. Uh, I got us, uh, got us started a little earlier. Gonna wrap a little earlier. Bully for me. I'll have time to, uh, to swing by the old, uh, xvideos.com and crank one out before the, uh, the work day begins. Before I go, I do want to once again remind you that on social media, you can find me at facebook.com slash the Savage Crew. That's where you're watching this lovely live stream. Uh, on Twitter, at Mike Montone. On Instagram at Gary underscore Moiler. That's M O Y L E R. And uh, of course, the uh, the podcast lives at the Savage Crew dot Libsyn dot com. And I think just for uh, just for fun, I will leave you with uh, Doctor Dow once again being dragged off of uh, of a United flight. Thank you guys for uh, for tuning in this morning. I had a great time. Please don't forget to.
to tell your friends about the show. Share it discreetly if you must. I realize the content is a tad blue and that uh, it's tough to, to publicly share these things. But look, you know who your scumbag friends are. Pass it along. You know they'll appreciate it. On that note, have a wonderful Thursday. Oh my god, look at what you did to him!